Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Minsker, the Legislative Advocacy Director for the Illinois PTA, and welcome to our 2021 Fall Advocacy Campaign Briefing this evening. Uh, we are joined today. Greg Hobbs is unable to make it today. He had a family emergency that he needed to travel for, but I have our Education Issues uh, Director Barb Quinn helping me out and Erica Nelson, our Federal Advocacy uh, or Federal Legislation consultant as well, helping me out on the technical side of things. So let's get started here. Uh, our fall advocacy campaign is going to run the next two weeks, October 19th through 28th, which coincides with the fall veto session for the legislature. And we will be talking about what issues we are going to be uh, addressing, what bills we hope to get moving. And we're going to also start off talking a little bit about how you advocate as a PTA member. And the first thing to remember is PTA's mission, which is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. And this really informs everything we do as PTA and has for the last 125 years. Uh, when you look back at why we were founded, it was Alice McClellan Bernie, uh, Bernie looking around her community and seeing children working in you know, factories, children leaving school after fifth grade or eighth grade, uh, children thrown into adult prisons and felt that somebody needed to speak up for them. And she had her uh, a friendly ear in Phoebe Apperson Hearst. Uh, and the two of them formed the National Congress of Mothers in 1897 in Washington, DC to have a group. Alice wrote that she would be happy if 20 people showed up in her diary the next day when they were going to have that. And she got over 2000 people showing up and National PTA has been advocating for children ever since. And uh, a lot of those things that we take for granted uh, in American life come from PTA advocacy, such as child labor laws, the juvenile justice system, the public health system, kindergarten, childhood immunizations, the school lunch program, even something as simple and common as school bus swing arms uh, came about because of a resolution here in Illinois. Uh, that a, a local unit had a tragedy where a child was killed in front of a school bus, brought a resolution to the Illinois PTA convention. The convention uh, membership adopted the resolution, uh, in, which resolved for us to advocate for these. We found legislators willing to sponsor legislation. It was passed and now those are you know, common across the country. Uh, but those started with one unit uh, doing some advocacy at the local level and through the resolution process. So don't think that one PTA unit cannot make a difference or even one voice. And you are an advocate already. If you've ever spoken to a teacher about a classroom issue uh, with your kid, a principal about a school problem or a superintendent or a school board about a district policy, you've already been an advocate. And so it's important to remember that you already know how to do this. Talking to legislators is really no different than talking to those teachers or principals or superintendents. So why do we want PTAs to advocate? Because PTA folks know the needs of students and families better than anybody else. And the PTA brand brings a lot of credibility to issues. I know as a PTA pr uh, president for Illinois, standing or sitting in front of committees at, at the legislature in Springfield, and telling them I was speaking on behalf of the 60 or 70,000 members of the Illinois PTA at the time, it, it really got them to sit up and pay attention to what I had to say. Um, and so that PTA name recognition really does matter. And the other reason to be a PTA advocate is very often nobody else is speaking up for the children and especially at the local level. So your, your PTA councils and, and your individual PTAs speaking up at the school board, you can be a huge difference in the lives of those children in your district by speaking up. Now we are 501c3 organizations. And so there are some IRS requirements when we are advocates. First off, we have to direct our advocacy efforts on issues, not people. Uh, basically that we have to talk about things we want to accomplish. We can't endorse candidates. We can't imply that the PTA supports any individual candidate or anything like that. So it's issues, not people. We have to be nonpartisan. When we have a school board candidate forum, we have to invite every candidate. 
even though they may not all show up. But we have to not take any sides. We are nonpartisan through and through in our advocacy efforts. And the IRS requires that our advocacy efforts are an insignificant part of our budget, which they have determined means 5%, which as a local PTA unit, that means you could spend 5% on yard signs for a school referendum if your PTA has chosen to support it um, and your membership is supporting it. But you can't really go much beyond that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how do you get in touch with your legislator? And this is uh, various times you may wanna do this. This is beyond the uh, fall advocacy campaign where we will have pre-written things ready for you in our calls to action. But if you have an issue you wanna to speak to a legislator about, this is how you go about finding them. And the first and easiest is with Illinois PTA Voter Voice, which is our advocacy tool that we use at the state level and national PTA uses as well nationally. And the way you find this is if you go to the Illinois PTA website and you click on the advocacy button up at the top, and then when the advocacy page comes up, you click on the take action uh, menu item there on the side. And when you get there over on the sidebar, there is a sign up for alerts, which is what you do if you wanna get calls to action. Um, if you wanna find information about a specific bill, uh, you can type in keywords on it or, or even the bill number. Uh, we don't have a scorecard going right now, but that shows how PTA or how legislators have voted on PTA issues. Um, but the, if you want to find your elected officials, if you're not sure who your state representative is or your congressional representative for that matter, uh, you just type in your zip code there and uh, it may also ask for your street because your district may not be all within one zip code or you may have more than one district in your zip code and it'll pop up your national officials as well, but this is just the state officials here. So you can also contact the governor, the lieutenant governor, governor, secretary of state, attorney general, treasurer, or comptroller, but it'll also have your state senator and your state representative there. And the easiest way to send them an email directly is just to check that little box there next to their picture and hit compose message here in voter voice. Um, and that will take you right to a form where you can type in the message you wanna to send to them. If you also wanna find out a bit more about your legislator, uh, you can click on that link that they have. And here is Senator Bennett um, from the 52nd district here. Uh, it does not have his email address here. Um, some of them do, uh, but it does have a link to the General Assembly's website page, which we'll show in a little bit. It also has his Facebook page and his Twitter as well. If you go to his Facebook page, very often they will have a send message. So you can send them a message on Instant Messenger if that's the way you wanna contact them. And it also, if you notice down in the lower right-hand corner has a link to his campaign website at senatorbennett.com. Senator Bennett also on his Twitter has his campaign website there. So you can tweet at him uh, if you wanna addre address him that way or tag him in a tweet regarding legislation or advocacy. Uh, it also shows you his campaign website and pretty much every legislator's campaign website also has a contact us button of some way to get in touch with them. So that's another way you can contact your legislator. And as I said, here's uh, Representative Marin and he does have his email address here on the uh, available publicly here in the uh, voter voice tool. Other things you can find here just off the, as when you're on this page, the background talks a little bit about their education and stuff. Uh, political talks about what committees they're serving on at the, in Springfield. Staff gives you the name of their staffer in Springfield and any local uh, staffers as well. And bills they've co-sponsored are there also. The other way to contact your website or your uh, Legislator is through the Illinois General Assembly website, which is ilga.gov. And when you go there, you can see the members uh, under Senate and the House there. You also can see the list of bills up at the top, uh, which will give you all the bills that are, have been in, uh, submitted this session. And it's over 4,000 House bills and a couple thousand Senate bills. So it is a big pile of legislation out there. Uh, but when you go to the members, 
you can see Senator Bennett here. He has a list. It has what bills he sponsors, what committee he serves on. And his page here also has his committee assignments, has a little of his biography, also has the two representatives that are in his Senate district. And it also has additional district addresses, which for senators you will find uh, mainly because they tend to, because they have two representatives in their district, they often have two offices. Uh, representative may only have one office in their district, or they may have two, depending on where they live in their district. And there is Representative Marone's page as well. And again, it shows what his senator is, and he does have his email there. So you may think, all right, I know how to get in touch with my legislator, but why do I want to do this? Uh, the one thing people, you know, there are a few myths about this. One thing is that legislators aren't interested in the voices of parents when it comes to crafting policies. They think parents don't know anything about politics is, is kind of what people often think. They don't want to hear from little old me. Uh, but that's not true at all. Uh, legislators are very concerned about those who are affected by the legislation that's in front of them and they want your feedback. They wanna know how this is gonna affect the people in their district and the stories that you bring. So that's an important thing that you bring to the table when you contact your legislator. Another myth you may sometimes, some people have is that meeting with a staff member isn't important as meeting with my legislator. In Springfield, that, that may be true. They often have just an administrative aid there in Springfield. In the district office though, you have somebody who actually works on policy as well as working in the office. Um, so even if you can't catch up with your legislator in your uh, local office, meeting with a, a staffer there can be just as important and they will get in touch. Even if you call uh, the office and leave a message, they do keep a tally of how people are urging them to vote on various pieces of legislation as well. And the third myth people have is that my meeting won't mean as much if I only meet with my legislator once. If I don't have that relationship like the lobbyists do, where they are talking to the same legislators over and over all the time. Uh, and that's not true at all, because like I said, legislators want to know from the people in their district, and they don't hear from a whole lot, especially not in person and especially not in phone calls. Um, and so when they get those one-on-one -on -one conversations and hear the stories about how something is going to affect people in their district, they are very attentive to that. Whenever you're speaking with a legislator, we in PTA like to refer them to our ABCs of meeting with them. Always be accurate, be brief, and be courteous. Make sure you have your facts in hand beforehand in terms of being accurate. Get to the point fairly quickly because they are very busy very often. Sometimes if they are having meetings in their district, uh, you may only have a five minute slot to talk to them. They may have meetings lined up back to back. Uh, so being very brief can be, you know, is very important. So make sure you know that the one or two points you really want to get across on a piece of legislation. And of course, always be courteous. Uh, as the old saying, you, you know, my grandmother used to tell you, you catch more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. So always be polite. Always be courteous. Uh, yelling at a legislator will not make them support your side. Ryan, can I interject one thought? Because uh, I know this has come up before, and that is uh, not to assume that the legislator, based on their previous voting record or maybe a conversation you've had, uh, doesn't need to hear from you uh, on that issue. Even though they may have said, I support it, it still is reinforcing to reach out with that quick email uh, and uh, to be reinforcing that from a PT, Illinois PTA perspective. That's a good point, Erica, thank you. And, and another thing to remember is that if they haven't voted the way you tend to prefer in the past, that doesn't mean that your voice doesn't make a difference either. I know I've had conversations with legislators before and some of the things I've said have made to go, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, so that you can maybe change their mind. Uh, I know in talking with some legislators about school funding and talking about the economic impact of school funding rather than the importance of funding schools to educate children is a, a perspective they don't often think about. Um, so having some of these conversations, uh, even if you don't think your legislator is receptive necessarily to your message can make a difference, or even if you think they already know how that they're already gonna vote for you, 
having that reinforcement is still an important thing to do. So make your voice heard. The fact that, you know, they get an email is, is big, a phone call, they probably count it as almost like getting 10 emails and having somebody come and talk to them specifically about an issue is probably like getting 100 emails. You're putting that effort out there. It really carries a lot of weight. So when you're preparing for your meeting, you know, as we said, be aware of their position on your issue. Um, and, and don't let the fact that their position is not your position discourage you from meeting with them. Make sure you know what you're asking for um, and, and specifically what you're asking them to do. Know all the talking points that you have that support what you're asking. And finally, practice what you're gonna do because sometimes, like we said, you're gonna have five minutes or you may have five minutes and they get called, you know, something comes up and they only give you three minutes. So knowing your pitch and exactly what you want to get in there helps you even when those little sudden, oh, I've got to run to the floor for a vote um, moments come up. When you get there, be a few minutes early. Sometimes your legislator's running a little early, which can help if they have that interruption that's going to cut your other end of your meeting off. Uh, introduce yourself. Be sure to introduce yourself as a PTA member. Uh, as we said, the PTA brand carries some weight. Make a connection. Uh, I know when I've met with some, if I've run into them at, at a, uh, an event somewhere else, whether it's at an advanced Illinois dinner or uh, a PTA council event that they were at, um, just saying, hey, I, I had a chance to meet you back you know, a year ago at this event and uh, be sure to thank them for taking the time to meet with you and then have a conversation with them. Make your pitch, ask, you know, tell them what you're asking them to do then allow them to ask questions and be sure to share your stories. Barb, you wanna add I, something? I'd like to interject here, if at all possible, when you conclude that meeting, if you have the ability to leave them some literature about our positions so that if they don't have time to really digest everything you're saying at the meeting, they can refer back to the literature you've left with them so that they have a Understanding of what we're asking for and why. That's a very good point. And, you know, it also gives them, uh, you know, even if they don't necessarily read it right off the back, their staffer most certainly will and, and give them a digest of the issues. And, and as we said, share your stories. They want to know how things are personally going to affect your family, your kids, the people in your school district, uh, you know, when you talk about what legislators want to hear, 91% want information on the effect of the bill on what it's going to mean in their district. They want 90% want why you're supporting or opposing a bill or an issue. And 79% want a personal story related to the bill. When we're talking about uh, safe gun storage, which is one of the bills we are focusing on here. If you have a story about a friend who's had somebody commit suicide because of easy access to a, a gun that wasn't stored properly. Something along those lines can help personalize why this is an important issue for you and why they should also assign it a lot of weight. And it's important that they support this issue as you go. When you're wrapping up your meeting, keep track of the time. So make sure that you cover all those key talking points. As Barb said, leave behind an issue summary and your contact information in case they have any follow-up questions. Um, and again, thank them for your time. It's always part of being those, that, that courteous uh, and being nice and friendly with them. Afterwards, send them a follow-up. Thank you for meeting with them. If they had any questions that you didn't know the answer to, and don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I have some information I know back at home. I can send that to you when I get back to it. Provide any of that, in, that additional information that they ask for. Um, you know, and if you've met with a legislator, feel free to drop us a line and say, hey, I met with Senator so-and-so uh, about safe gun storage and drop it in an email to advocacy at IllinoisPTA.org. We're always happy to hear about what folks are doing out there. All right, we're going to talk a little bit now about the fall advocacy campaign and our issues. Uh, things to remember about the legislator, this is the fall veto session. Uh, the spring session, they do most of their bill passage, um, and they passed an awful lot of bills that we supported this spring. Uh, 
So, I mean, there's there's still things in the legislature that legislature that they haven't passed that we care about. We're focusing on three topics here uh, that we think are very important and that are also important to our members and are fairly easy, we think, to talk to legislators about. So even if you haven't you know, talked to a legislator about these issues before, we think that they are something that you would understand fairly easily and can make a case for very easily and be comfortable speaking to a legislator with. Uh, because as we said, a lot of the legislation passed in the spring session, most of the things are sitting in what are known as rules in the House or the assignments uh, in the Senate. The way the Illinois legislator works is that bills are required to have three readings on three separate days. And the first couple of days of the legislature are pretty much reading those first readings of all the bills that have been submitted. And it's, you know, Senate Bill 1, a bill on blank, yeah, school funding. Um, it's, it's often a traditional one for that. <laughs> uh, and the clerk of the, the Senate or the House just reads through the bill list to get that first reading in. They need a second reading on another day and then a third reading. That second reading is usually when it comes to the floor and gets amended. The third reading is the passage to get it out of that House or the Senate and over to the other side of the uh, assembly. So what we're looking at are bills that are currently sitting in rules or assignment waiting for a committee to be assigned. Uh, but the fact that you start talking to legislators about them uh, gets them moving. We saw this a few years back with the testing of drinking water sources in schools. That was a bill that had been stuck in uh, the rules committee since the spring when we came and talked about it and got it going. The next day it started picking up co-sponsors, got legislation going passed one house in the veto session and, and passed another in the uh, lame duck session they did in January, just before the new uh, assembly came in. So the fact that these bills haven't moved yet does not really mean that they can't get moving without a little push. Um, they just need to know that somebody's interested in actually passing these bills and that very often gets their attention to pay attention to what this is. So our three focus issues, as we mentioned, is one is safe gun storage. That's based on a resolution that was passed at convention this spring. Uh, the second one is the flavored e-cigarette ban, which also dates back to a resolution we passed a couple years ago on electronic uh, nicotine delivery systems. And the third is a couple of juvenile justice bills. Uh, one, Senate Bill 1825 that requires legal representation during questioning for everybody under 18. And the second one is House Bill 111 that will move the misdemeanor age for juvenile court from 18 to 19. That's already passed the House, so it's over in the Senate. So we only have to get that one moving through one House. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. We'll talk about what the issue is, talk about what we're asking, and give you some of the talking points. And when you... Brian, can I, Brian, can I interrupt really quickly, just in case folks have a question? Um, are, how are we following up to provide this data to folks who attended tonight and or couldn't attend but might want it? I was just about to say, we... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, we have an issue packet here that will have the legislative platform and all the information here, as well as links to our calls to action. When you go to the calls to action, it will be linked in the, the paragraph at the top where it talks about the issue for you. So you'll have those to draw on. We will email it out to everybody who is registered here as well, uh, as soon as we get that taken care of. Um, so we will have that in another day or two for you. Uh, and then the calls to action will go out. And as we said in the, the header for that, where it talks about the issue on voter voice, uh, separate from the letter that goes to legislators, it will have the information packets there as well that you can draw on. Um, so we do have some information for you on this as well. So you don't have to scribble frantically taking notes, um, but we will have this available for you. And we'll probably, I think we can probably get a link to it also that goes out in the weekend update here. Um, so I will talk to Ashton about that and making sure that's in the, the weekend update this Friday. So our first, uh, issue we're talking about is safe gun storage. And as we said, this was based on a resolution that was passed at convention this past spring at, con um, at convention. Um, 
And these two bills, there's one in the House and one in the Senate, they're fairly similar. Um, so we are really pushing on both of them to get moving. If one moves in the Senate, for example, and, and the House bill doesn't move, we will really put our efforts behind the Senate bill. Uh, but, you know, we're happy with either one of these going forward, and we're going to aim them, uh, you know, one at the senators and one at the representatives to get either bill moving. And if I could just interject here, sure. this is not a new topic for the Illinois PTA. In 1999, we adopted a continuing position um, calling for the legislature to create a child access prevention regulations that would inflict, so to speak, penalties on families uh, or parents who failed to properly secure weapons. Thank you, Barb. It's not a new topic for us. Yeah, so, and a continuing position means that, you know, Illinois PTA had been advocating on it for a few years before turning it into a continuing position. So it's probably close to 25 years now that we've been advocating on this. Um, some of the data, you know, some reasons this is an important thing, over 600 issue, children die by suicide annually. And, and most of them, when they are successful, are using a family member's gun to commit suicide. Uh, between 70 and 90% of the school, guns used in school shootings by minors came from their home or the home of a relative or a friend. And nearly a quarter of all gun owners report storing their guns in an unlocked location in the house. So the two bills here, House Bill 552 would require firearm owners to store any firearm in a secured lock container with penalties for failing to do so. Uh, Senate Bill 1855 is a little bit different. It makes it unlawful for a person to keep or store a unsecured firearm in a residence when it is reasonably known that a minor or a person ineligible to possess the firearm is likely to gain access without permission uh, with penalties for failing to do so. So that one's a little bit more nuanced than House Bill 552. Um, but again, either one of those we would be supportive of getting going here. And so we will have uh, a call to action on them both here. Uh, what are we asking for our resident representatives? It's to co-sponsor House Bill 552 or uh, Senate Bill 1855 if the Senate passes that bill first. Uh, move it out of the rules committee because after it comes from the Senate, it will go to rules. Um, and when it comes to the floor for a vote, bring it to the floor for a vote and to support it. And for our senators, it, it's kind of the mirror image of that support 1855 or the House bill if it comes through the House first. Um, and move it out of assignments and bring it to the floor and support it. If you were talking to uh, your representative or your uh, senator about this issue, there are a few facts here that we have for talking points for you. Uh, one, suicide rates among children and teens who live in a home with guns are four times higher than those in homes without guns. And research has shown that the suicide risk in homes with guns can be cut in half by doing any one of the following, and that's storing the firearm in a locked storage unit, storing it unloaded, or storing it separate from the ammunition. Uh, and when Asked about this, only 10% of the gun owning adults with children in their home are aware that having that gun increases the suicide risk. So it, it, there is not a lot of awareness out there among gun owners about the suicide risk and that it is four times higher having that gun in there. So making sure that it is secured, safe, locked, unloaded, separate from the ammunition can do tremendous things for reducing the suicide rate. Barb, did you have anything to add on this? Okay. Our second issue is on banning flavored e-cigarettes. And again, this came from a resolution, our position came from a resolution from a couple of years ago on e-cigarettes and access by minors. Uh, there again, these are two separate bills. They are very similar. One in the Senate is 2282. In the House, it's 4,050 or 4050. Um, and both of them pretty much say the same thing in this case. There's not very much difference. Uh, they prohibit the sale, offering for sale, or possession with intent to sell of any flavored e-cigarette or fla related flavor product, which would be the, the little uh, flavoring liquid 
containers, not just the e-cigarette itself with the stuff in it already. Uh, prohibits also the online purchase or shipping to somebody in Illinois. So you can't go and buy it online if you can't buy it in the stores as well. And it includes electronic cigarettes and related flavor products in the provisions that are already in law about illegal transportation of cigarettes. So that just criminalizes transporting these things around as well. And the reason we're talking about flavored e-cigarettes in particular is they are very popular with children, uh, far much more so than they are with adults. Uh, our ask, again, for most of these things with bills that are in rules or assignments is to co-sponsor the bill um, or the corresponding bill in the other house if it, it moves first, move it to the floor for a vote and support for passage. When you're talking about uh, flavored e-cigarettes, we have several things we want to talk about. One, National PTA and the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids are collaborating right now to raise awareness and help uh, prevent e-cigarette and other tobacco use uh, among youth. You can go to pta.org and they have some information there as well. And the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids also has some information on their website. Right now, 3.6 million children use e-cigarettes including nearly one in five high school students. And in a 2020 survey of Illinois high school students, 4.7% uh, uh, reported using an electronic tobacco product. Nationally, the average for high school students is six. So we're doing a little bit better in education here in Illinois on that, uh, but there's still an issue. In August, 2021, early this year, they, the spring they passed it, it was signed by the governor in August. Uh, it includes e-cigarettes and vaporing products uh, in the education of students on the use of medical, on the medical and legal ramifications of alcohol, drug use, and tobacco products. So it's now rolled into the health curriculum that schools are teaching. You may have heard the Food and Drug Administration um, has been doing some on this as well. They banned uh, menthol-flavored cigarettes in April of this year. And in August 2021, there was a, a talk uh, I know there was a bit of publicity about the FDA banning uh, 55,000 flavored e-cigarette products, but these came from three smaller manufacturers. Um, and while the FDA is making progress on it, the reason we're backing Illinois doing a ban is because the FDA action really only covered a small percentage, you know, 55,000 sounds like a large amount, but they had 6.5 million applications for different products flavored e-cigarette products that they need to approve or disapprove. Um, and they have not touched any of the makers that have uh, significant march share, such as um, Juul, which is also the most popular brand with children. So we want to get these things away from children now before the FDA gets around to it. They have a huge number still to work their way through. Um, they have done about 1% of the application so far. So they have a long way to go. A flavored e-cigarette ban here in Illinois would do a lot to make a difference here in Illinois. Our third and final issue is two bills on juvenile justice reform. Uh, the first bill is Senate Bill 1815. It requires that those under 18 must have legal counsel throughout their interrogation for any offense. Um, currently, Illinois only requires legal counsel for those who are under eight or under 15 and only for specific offenses. So they are not guaranteed a lawyer at, for any offense at this point, unless they are under 15 and unless they have committed or accused of a specific crime, rather. House Bill 111 is our second one. Uh, this one would raise the age of for misdemeanors access to the juvenile justice system to 19, which means those 18 to 19 would be able to access it uh, starting in January 1st, 2023. And it also has a provision to increase it to 21 starting on January 1st, 2024. This is in line with a resolution we passed at convention and a study done by the Illinois PTA, uh, I wanna say 2017 or so, uh, 2018, I think was when we passed, um, the recommendations to the report to raise these misdemeanor ages. Um, as we said, uh, House Bill 111, which is for raising the misdemeanor age, has already passed the House. So if you spout to a representative, 
thank them for supporting uh, the bill if they voted for it. You can check that on voter voice and how they voted on specific bills uh, by looking at, at uh, their member page as we showed at the beginning. And also ask them to co-sponsor Senate Bill 1825 when it comes to the House and support it when it comes to the floor for a vote. For the senators, we want them to co-sponsor both bills, move them out of the assignment building uh, committee and bring them to the floor for a vote and support them. When you're talking about SB 1825, representing uh, for legal representation, here are the talking points that we think are particularly resonant. One, first off, Illinois passed a law just this year banning the police from lying to those under 18 while they're being interrogated. Um, clearly, Illinois would not have passed a law if this were not an issue. And um, it would also mean that we need lawyers there to help protect their rights when they are faced with that issue. Uh, right now, minors can't legal, legally consent to in many areas. They can't rent a vehicle. They can't sign a contract. They can't rent a hotel room in many cases um, because they aren't legally adults. And so we don't let them do that. Why would we let them legally waive their right of counsel? And finally, legal counsel for those under 18 um, would help further protect the rights of those while they're being questioned. Finally, on House Bill 111, uh, our talking points with that on raising the misdemeanor age. Uh, Illinois has already done a phased approach with raising the misdemeanor age and for felonies too with the juvenile justice system from 16 to 17 and then 17 to 18 doing misdemeanors first, felonies later, um, and has seen a positive effect of doing that all the way through for 18. When you look at the report that Illinois PTA did, one of the things that we found was that those who are 18 to 25, especially those 18 to 21, uh, in terms of brain development and their behavior and their reaction to situations, they are much more similar to their teenage younger counterparts than they are to adults. Um, and so our recommendation has always been to treat them separately from the adult system from that report because they aren't making decisions and really the brain development doesn't finish until about age 25. Access to the juvenile justice system for those under 18 or under 19 and then phasing up to those under 21 after a year means that they avoid an adult arrest record in cases that might not even go to court uh, for misdemeanors here. Uh, very often they are not in court issues. Uh, by avoiding an adult arrest record, they don't have issues necessarily with housing, with education and employment later on in life that those arrest records sometimes happen. The juvenile justice system has more diversion options, more treatment options uh, available and than the adult court system, which can help avoid getting those people back at re repeat offenders by keeping them out of the adult system and into the juvenile system where they can get more uh, support. And finally, and this was one of the big findings of our report as well, is that most uh, people who have committed crimes sort of age out by the time they reach their mid-20s, when their brain fully develops, uh, so that if they have not encountered the adult, adult uh, criminal system by the time they hit age 25, chances are they won't hit it at all. Um, so keeping them out of the adult system a little bit longer to 19 to 21 for those misdemeanors especially can help avoid our prison population down the road, recidivism, and help make these young adults move on to productive members of society as they go along. I see we've had a couple of things pop up in the chat. Do we have some questions, Barb or Erica? Uh, I don't see any questions in chat on my end. All right. And no hands up. All right. I, I uh, there was a question from one of the attendees about whether or not the campaign for the fall will be virtual, and I responded that yes, it would. Okay. And secondly, what and I mentioned the fact that the spring campaign, as of this moment, is scheduled to be in person. Yes, thank you. That's right. We are all virtual on this one, and that's a nice segue here. 
to make sure you get the calls for action. As we talked about, going to voter voice, click that advocacy tab on the Illinois PTA website, click take action over in the sidebar, the top one, sign up for alerts. Enter your email and your zip code. Uh, and again, it may ask for a street address as well. That's just so they can identify your representative or your senator, depending on how the district splits up your zip code or the districts split up your zip code or not. Um, if your zip code is all in one district, it won't ask you for an address. Um, but that is just so it knows who your legislators are. Uh, and we will send out calls to action on each of these topics. And you will get an email that says, take action. And it will have a little bit of background information for you. It will have a link to our issue packet in it as well. Um, and then you can click on the take action button that will be in one of those calls to action. It will take you to voter voice. There will be, again, a little header area with some information about the issue. And over on the side, there will be a pre-written let letter to your legislator. And all you really have to do is put in your information in terms of contact information so your legislator can get back to you. Uh, but if you want to edit this letter, you can do that. You can add a personal story about how something will affect you. And we always encourage our members to do that. As we said, personal stories, almost 80% of legislators want to know a personal story. And over 90% want to know how this will affect your their district. So what your expertise is in how this will affect your children, the children at your school, stories you have from your experience in your community can make a big difference in getting a legislator to support a piece of legislation, to co-sponsor it, and to you know, help bring things to the floor and support them. So as we said, when you get that, you can add your own personal story. You got to enter your contact information. It ensures it goes to the correct legislator and so they get back to you. There will be a separate call to action for each bill. So you'll get three or four emails. Usually when we do one, it is a single bill and it's usually at a certain time. Um, so we don't do a whole lot of in emailing out of this, but for the fall campaign where we're pushing on three specific topics and six different bills, you may get a bunch of emails, but normally they are not that often. So don't feel that we're gonna be spamming you constantly with this. We will occasionally do a, a blog post on legislative success or legislative issues or opportunities to testify um, or a call to action on a specific bill that needs specific action. So. As we said, our fall advocacy campaign is coming up October 19th through 28th. That is the fall veto session. If you are not signed up for our take action campaign, go ahead and do that. You know, go tonight. You can take two minutes to do it. Well, actually, probably about 30 seconds to do it. Clicking on there and typing in your information so that you're on the email list. You get those calls to action. When you get a call to action, if all you do is click the button, and go type in your contact information, you can send a letter to your legislator in about a minute and a half to two minutes. And it can make a lot of difference. We've seen this before where Illinois PTA advocacy makes a big difference in how things get moving that have been stalled in the legislature and make a huge difference in the lives of kids. Uh, you know, The most recent example I think of is, is testing for drinking water sources in schools where we passed that one with advocacy from PTA. It was a bill that was sitting there, not going anywhere. And now we have testing from all our schools for K-5 schools, including private schools. Those young children are not getting exposed to lead sources. They have to inform parents when they have tests that show there's a lead issue in their drinking water. It makes a huge difference for those children. And if you have any questions that you think about, um, during the campaign or, or before we even start, my email is up there, bminsker at illinoispta.org. I am happy to answer questions. Uh, feel free to contact me. Greg Hobbs, our president-elect is also up there too. He would be happy to. And thank you for joining us. Are there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, I was trying to find my mute. Um, how do I get parents, um, like in my units and things like that to advocate if, if a specific issue is maybe not something that they personally 
might be against, but it might be for the greater good. How do I kind of urge them to look at it in a bigger picture? Um, that's always a challenge. Um, you know, part of advocacy, you know, it's right there as being an advocate uh, for an issue. So it is, you know, I understand that safe gun storage may be a controversial topic, for example, uh, for some folks. Uh, but when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is not uh, gun control. We're not talking about taking away guns. We're talking about making sure it's stored safely, that children don't have access. We know, you know, far too often you read in the paper or, or see a news story in social media about a child who found a gun, their parents' gun, and it was loaded and it discharged and killed or wounded a sibling, a friend, you know, those are tragedies, but they are very preventable through something like just safely storing guns. And as we said, even when you talk about suicide risk, which is four times greater um, for homes with guns, 10%, only 10% are even aware that having a gun in the house increases the risk of suicide among kids. Um, so some of this is education and using the talking points that we would with a legislator with somebody else that, you know, this is an important topic. It's about preventing tragedy, or it is um, with e-cigarettes, it's about health for children and making sure that they don't start down the use of tobacco products. Uh, it, Ryan, it, I would, go ahead, I, sorry to interrupt, I was thinking too, that um, and you're you're kind of uh, going in that direction, but part of the challenge to um, and that we relate to what you're saying, Daniel, is um, reminding people that as um, leaders within their local PTA unit or at council, like you are, that this is a holistic approach. And so while I might have an opinion, uh, bringing this to the table at council, bringing it to your local unit to discuss it helps to raise those, but also educate people, which I think Brian has done a really good job of presenting tonight, uh, things that they may not know that could then bring them to that understanding. This is for all, all children, not only the children in our region, area, district, unit, whatever it might be. So if that helps, I think it's a reminder of why we're doing this. And it's this advocacy is holistic as well as individual. Thank you, Erica. And, and I think another thing you may talk about is, you know, say the, the legal counsel issue. You may think, well, my kid's never going to get arrested. And very likely they may not. I mean, but if they are ever arrested or, or brought in by a police officer, wouldn't you want somebody there protecting their rights if they haven't gotten around to contacting you to get you there either. Um, you know, we have seen police officers. I know there was a tragedy in Naperville where uh, a young boy, young man was brought in and talked to a school resource officer about something. And the officer was somewhat threatening about, you know, how he'd really kind of screwed up his life here. And the kid went out and, and killed himself right after you know, so if he were having that questioning conversation only with a lawyer present, maybe a tragedy could have been prevented, you know, and, and any kid, wouldn't you want a lawyer there as a parent, regardless of whether it's your kid, a friend's kid, or a kid you don't even know, wouldn't you want somebody there to make sure that they are protected and getting the legal rights they have? Did you have a follow up there, Daniel? I saw you unmute briefly. No, I was going to say, well, just because my wife works for the police department, I think my kids would just be happier that the resource officer caught them first. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably true. They, they, they may want a lawyer at home, too, when mom's talking to them. <laughs> but I don't think it empowers them for that. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? If not, thank you for joining us uh, and, and do share uh, the link to sign up for the call to action with your local members as well. 
Uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you all will be contacting your legislators in the next couple of weeks. We can get these bills moving and make a difference in the lives of children. Thank you and good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.